Next is for uh, a, a nice introduction, and uh, thank you, thank you all for uh, for coming here. I was uh, I was talking to Liz before my talk, and uh, I said, you know, I've, I've probably given five talks about this book since uh, since it came out last year, and uh, I don't think I've ever felt so nervous as I do tonight. <laughs> and I, something about uh, talking to uh, about this with my friends and neighbors. It's a little bit more, for whatever reason, just before I came over here, I got, I got very nervous, so hopefully that won't show. But uh, I've been living in, uh, I moved to Bozeman in 2009, and, uh, but I've been living in Belgrade uh, for the last two and a half years. Uh, I moved up here in the uh, middle of uh, 2021. Uh, in fact, I live just down the street from this library, so I hope I don't humiliate myself, because this is really kind of my neighborhood. Uh, so, but, but thank you, thank you very much uh, for, for being here. As, uh, as Liz mentioned, and as I'm sure you, you know, um, the, the, this book series is, is mainly about spies. Uh, my talk is not about spies, I'm sorry, but uh, almost as good as spies are defectors. And I'm gonna be talking about a defector, and that's pretty cool. Um, typically, you know, when, when we read about defectors or hear about them, Cold War era defectors, uh, and we typically hear about people who were uh, escaping from behind the Iron Curtain uh, to the West. Um, but the person that I'm going to be talking about uh, escaped uh, to uh, the Iron Curtain in 1951 during what was at the time considered to be the, the height uh, of, the, uh, of the Cold War. Uh, and so in, in telling uh, the story tonight, I'm, I'm trying to ask answer the question of uh, why uh, someone would escape to the East Block, Eastern Block in uh, 1951, and, uh, and what the consequences uh, of this were. Um, first of all, I, uh, I better introduce the, uh, the person I'm talking about, uh, uh, Nazim Hikmet. Uh, tell me, before you uh, had uh, seen the advertisement for this talk, is, is there anybody here who had heard of Nazim Hikmet before? No? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great, good. Um, that's, no, that, that's, that's, that's perfect. Um, just, just kind of curious. Um, so uh, this is Nazim Hikmet. Uh, he, uh, he's a, he was a Turkish writer. Uh, he was best known uh, for uh, his poetry. Um, and without question, um, I would say he's the, uh, the best known and, and probably one could say most beloved uh, literary figure uh, in Turkey. Uh, indeed, I'd say he's more than just a literary figure. Um, he's quite an important historical uh, figure uh, as well. Um, literally hundreds of books have been written about uh, Nazi Pigmet, uh, mostly in Turkish, but also, but not, not exclusively. Uh, there have also been dozens uh, of books about him uh, written in uh, other languages, including three uh, full-length uh, biographies uh, in English, uh, uh, a third of which being my own, uh, which, uh, which came out uh, in uh, March of, of last year. So, um, who, who is, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, you know, let, let's, let's look into who this guy is and um, why so many people uh, seem to be interested in him. Um, Nazim Hikmet was uh, born in 1902 uh, in uh, a city called Salonika, uh, which today is uh, known as Thessaloniki. Uh, he was born in uh, the Ottoman Empire. Let's see if I can get this thing working. Um, okay, he was born in the, uh, there we go, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, which was, uh, it was an empire that existed until the end of World War I, uh, and basically including in the early 20th century uh, territories in southeastern Europe and what is today Turkey, uh, as well as much of the uh, Arab uh, Middle East. Uh, and this is kind of uh, uh, a more recent uh, map right here uh, on the right. Um, uh, when uh, when Nazi Hikmet was still uh, rather young, uh, his family uh, moved uh, to Istanbul. Um, and uh, he came from quite an interesting family, 
actually. That's, that's his mother on the far left, and uh, his sister, and then that's Nazim Hikmet, in a photograph that's probably from the early 1930s, um, and that's Nazim Hikmet's father uh, on the right. Um, the family was not particularly wealthy, um, but they were, they were very well known. Um, it was quite a prestigious family, and on both sides of Nazim Hikmet's family, both his mother's side and his father's side, uh, there were a number of quite illustrious, uh, well-known uh, statesmen, Ottoman statesmen, and uh, military leaders. Um, so people that you know, anyone growing up in Turkey today would kind of know of those people from standard uh, Turkish history textbooks. Um, interestingly, you know, his mother um, had a, a couple of relatives in her family uh, who had come from Europe to the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. Uh, in one case, uh, one was a Huguenot, uh, a Protestant Frenchman whose family had fled France, uh, a fellow named Carl Detroit, or Carl Detroit, uh, and uh, who uh, later uh, emigrated to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, he was on a, uh, like a merchant ship, uh, and then this fellow Carl Detroit jumped ship uh, decided to stay in Istanbul, converted to Islam, uh, and became a very well-known political figure in mid-19th century uh, Ottoman politics. Uh, another relative of hers was a Polish count uh, named Konstantin Borzhensky, uh, who fled uh, to the Ottoman Empire after a failed revolution in Poland in 1848. Uh, came a lot of uh, Polish, uh, you know, quite uh, gentry, aristocratic figures uh, fled at that time. It was the time of a failed rebellion in Poland, ended up in the Ottoman Empire. Konstantin Borzhensky was uh, Nazim Hikmet's great grandfather, his mother's grandfather. And he too, uh, this Konstantin Borzhensky fellow, uh, converted to Islam and became very well known not as a political figure, but as a military leader in late uh, 19th century Ottoman history. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of a precedent for uh, the story I'm going to tell you about Nazim Hikmet uh, in his family tree. Uh, and also Nazim Hikmet's father, uh, so his father here on the right, uh, he uh, was a, a fairly important figure in the uh, Ottoman foreign ministry. Um, but uh, his father and his grandfather, so Nazim Hikmet's grandfather and great-grandfather, um, had both gotten, they were political figures who had both gotten in trouble uh, politically uh, with the sultan and the, and the regime in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. So on the one hand, uh, on Nazim Hikmet's mother's side, uh, there's this history of, of people crossing borders and uh, going to a different country and setting up a new life in that country. Uh, and on his father's side, there's, there's a history of getting into trouble politically. And these are both things that Nazim Hikmet would do manifestly throughout the course uh, of, of his life. Um, as a uh, teenager, uh, growing up in Istanbul, uh, Nazim Hikmet's uh, greatest interest uh, was poetry. Uh, and this, uh, this had something to do with the fact that most of his friends were also really into poetry uh, at this time. Uh, his best friend uh, is the guy on the far left over there, uh, whose name was uh, Bala Nureddin. Uh, Bala Nureddin came from a similar background as, uh, as Nazim Hikmet. Uh, both of them were very into poetry, but also Bala Nureddin's family. Um, not very well off financially, yet at, there was a lot of sort of prestige uh, with the family. But there were both kind of families that were on not doing so great financially uh, in the early years of the uh, 20th century. Although they still had lots of contacts with people in high government positions in the Ottoman Empire. So kind of an interesting background uh, for um, each of them. And uh, Nazim and Bala found themselves uh, at age 16 
uh, living in Istanbul uh, in 1918, uh, when World War I came to an end. And of course, the Ottoman Empire had been allied with Germany and Austria in World War I, and so the Ottoman Empire was defeated. Um, and in, starting in 1918, uh, Istanbul was uh, occupied uh, by the British. Um, meanwhile, in, uh, in Ankara, which is right here, and Ankara today is the capital of Turkey, but in 1921, uh, Ankara was just a little a dusty village, kind of uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, but in Ankara at this time, uh, a fellow named uh, Mustafa Kemal Pasha, uh, who today is better known as Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, uh, this fellow right here, uh, Atatürk would go on to become the first president of the Turkish Republic, and indeed he's considered to be the founder of the Turkish Republic in 1923. Um, but uh, starting in 1919, uh, Mustafa Kemal, um, in Ankara, uh, begins uh, to set up a resistance to the terms of the peace treaty that the Sultan had signed at the end of World War I. So um, perhaps some people out there uh, remember that there was a peace treaty that was signed outside of Paris that Germany was forced to sign at the end of World War I, which is often credited with kind of bringing on fascism uh, in the 30s. Uh, starting with a B, what, what treaty am I talking about, folks? Versailles. Yeah, well, uh, the Ottomans had similarly signed what was considered to be a very sort of harsh treaty uh, outside of Paris in a, in a suburb of Paris called Sèvres, um, which was going to completely dismember uh, the Ottoman Empire and basically turn it into a small rump state on the Black Sea. So basically, the Ottoman Empire was just going to be kind of like this. And Istanbul was supposed to be turned into an international city, sort of like uh, Hong Kong, uh, an international city under British uh, domination. And so Mustafa Kemal began to lead an ultimately successful uh, rebellion uh, against those terms in Ankara. And at the beginning of 1921, Nazim Hikmet and his best friend, uh, Bala Nureddin, uh, escaped from Istanbul, which you know, the British uh, occupying the city uh, were loath to allow sort of fighting age men to leave the city because a lot of them were going to join the resistance. Um, they escaped from Istanbul and then walked uh, all the way to Ankara. It took them several weeks uh, to do this um, in order to join uh, the resistance forces that Mustafa Kemal uh, had been organizing uh, in, uh, in Ankara. Uh, and so at the very beginning, it's January 1st, uh, 1921, uh, the two of them flee Istanbul, and they make their way uh, to, uh, to Ankara. Um, but there was another reason why uh, Nazim Hikmet uh, wanted to go to Ankara, and it had nothing to do with politics or saving uh, uh, Turkey from the Treaty of Sev. Uh, Nazim's girlfriend uh, was, uh, was in Ankara. <laughs> Uh, a woman named uh, Nuzhet, uh, and that's, that's Nazim Pigmet uh, on, the, uh, on the left. Um, Nuzhet and her family had also moved uh, to Ankara recently, also to show their support for the uh, Ankara government of uh, Mustafa Kemal uh, Atatürk. Um, and she uh, was uh, there uh, for for several weeks, as was uh, Nazim and his friend, uh, Bala Nureddin, uh, although they weren't able to see each other very much. Nazim Hikmet uh, committed sort of a major faux pas at the home of uh, her brother-in-law, and he was sort of forbidden from their house again in Ankara, so they were both in the same town. Ankara being a very small town, it was you know, not as easy to meet up surreptitiously as it was in a big city like Istanbul, which is where they had originally met and started dating. Um, so uh, Nazim and uh, his friend Bala uh, stayed in Ankara for several weeks. Uh, and then they were eventually given jobs um, working as teachers in a town called Bolu, uh, which is right here. Uh, and Bolu was um, 
a, a pretty small town, um, and uh, it, it was a, an area that was under the control of the Ankara government, uh, Gustav Kemal Ataturk. I mean, it's, it's interesting that two 19-year-old males uh, would not be asked to fight in the front lines. I mean, this is a time of quite severe warfare between Mustafa Kemal's forces in Ankara and the Greek army, which had invaded uh, this part of what is today Turkey. Um, it probably has something to do with the fact that Nazim Hikmet and uh, uh, Bala Nur Adin both came from pretty well-known families and had lots of important, powerful relatives in the Ankara government. Um, in their uh, respective memoirs uh, about this time in their lives, both Nazim and, and his friend Bala say that they very much wanted to uh, join the fight, but uh, they were not allowed to do so, which kind of strains credulity a little bit. Um, they were 19 years old. This was a time of, of real kind of national disaster. Um, it seems surprising uh, that they would be sent to go work as teachers. But uh, in any case, that's um, what they eventually did. Um, however, they didn't really uh, like Bolu uh, all that much. Um, it, it was uh, small. Uh, it, uh, you know, they're, they're, they didn't really know anybody. Um, it wasn't all that interesting. And then summer break started. So they go out there um, at the, uh, you know, sort of, um, it's about March of 1921. And um, school is eventually going to come to an end over the summer. Uh, and they get a postcard from Nazim Hikmet's girlfriend, Nuzhet. Uh, and she and her family had moved from Ankara to Tbilisi in Georgia. And uh, Georgia at this time it had only recently become part of the Soviet Union. Um, but it, was, it had a Bolshevik communist government, just like Russia uh, at this time. And so, you know, Nazim and Vala, they talked for a little while and uh, they decided, hey, it might be kind of interesting to go to Georgia. And part of the reason for this is uh, Nazim's girlfriend was there, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, but kind of another reason was this. Um, every single person who was interesting that Nazim Hikmet and his friend Vala had met on this journey, you know, which started on January 1st when they're sneaking out of Istanbul and they're walking for weeks to get to Ankara, then they're hanging out in Ankara for weeks, then they go to Bolu, wherever they went, the most interesting people that they met were people who were interested in communism in one way or another. Um, some of these people were communists themselves. One person that they meet uh, turned out to be a communist agent who had been sent uh, from Moscow to go and recruit Turks to the, the communist cause. Uh, other people were not themselves communists, but they just thought it was interesting, everything that was happening in uh, the Soviet Union and you know, just not necessarily from the perspective of sympathizers, but just thought it would be cool to go and see what a communist country looked like uh, in 1921. And so Nazim and Bala thought, they were like, well, news heads there, that's a plus. Uh, and everybody that we've been talking to has been encouraging us to go and visit a communist country that's right on the doorstep of our, you know, a neighboring country. Um, so, they, uh, they decided to do this, um, and uh, they uh, set off uh, from Bolu, uh, and this time they take a boat uh, down the Black Sea coast, and they end up in Batumi, uh, which is just about 10 miles north of what is today the Turkish border, uh, and uh, they spend some time there, and then they go to Tbilisi to try to find uh, Nazim's girlfriend, Nuzhet, they think maybe her family could give them jobs. Um, they're not really sure what they're going to do, Nazi and Bala. Um, they're not really thinking in terms of becoming communists. They weren't really in Georgia because they were communists, or they kind of fell into the category of people who were just sort of tourists and, and kind of wanted to see what communism looked like. 
They had heard a lot of people talking about communism and it piqued their interest, but again, they weren't communists themselves. Um, Nazim and Bala were thinking, well, if we can't find work in Georgia, maybe we'll uh, return to uh, Kars, uh, which was a city in Turkey that uh, had previously been part of Russia. Uh, so that city needed Turkish teachers. Um, they, they had a lot of different ideas open, and they had no particular destination in mind. These were two 19-year-olds. Uh, who were traveling around on their own, uh, meeting strangers, <laughs> talking to them. Uh, they found Bolu pretty boring, and they thought it might be kind of cooler to go and like seize this historical moment, And because who knows, maybe five years later, there isn't going to be any more communism, for all they know, in 1921. They don't have the perspective that we do of, say, oh, this will last until the early 1990s. No, um, so they, they want to go check it out and see if it's like people had talked to them. They want to see Newshead as well, and they're also kind of hoping Newshead's family can give them work and so they can earn a little bit of money. Um, they go to Tbilisi. Uh, they can't find uh, Newshead's family, but coincidentally, they bump into a group of older Turks who are dying the wool communists. And they're, they're, they're staying at the same hotel. They, they meet up in the, the, like the breakfast area of the hotel where they're all staying in Tbilisi. And uh, it's 10 Turkish communists who are staying there. Uh, and they actually live, so this is in Tbilisi where this is happening. They live back in Batumi and uh, are organizing a Turkish language communist newspaper. And they invite Nazim Hikmet and his friend Bala to join them. And this is work. Uh, and so they get a place to stay in uh, Batumi. And they're, they're able to, uh, to earn a little bit of money uh, as well. So again, this is largely by chance. Uh, they could have ended up in Kars. They could have ended up in Tbilisi, maybe working for Newshet's family if they had managed to find them. Um, if they had stayed at a different hotel, uh, maybe they never would have met these other people who give them work and take them back to uh, Tbilisi. So there's a great deal of chance involved every single step uh, of the way, um, as not just when they're in Georgia, but indeed during this whole journey that they're taking uh, from Istanbul all the way to uh, Tbilisi. So uh, they work in Batumi for about six months at this Turkish language uh, communist newspaper. And then uh, Nazim and Bala are invited because they joined the Turkish Communist Party, which was founded in the Soviet Union. It always existed in the Soviet Union. It wasn't a Turkish party, actually. Um, they, Nazim and his friend, uh, his friend joined the Turkish Communist Party and uh, they're invited to go up to Moscow to study at a university that had just been opened the year before called Communist University of the Toilers of the East, uh, otherwise known by its acronym, CUTE. <laughs> um, so they travel uh, from uh, Batumi to Tbilisi, and then they go from Tbilisi uh, up to Moscow, uh, to study uh, at this university. Uh, they leave Nuzhet behind, but she eventually visits them, uh, visits Nazim uh, in Moscow the following year, uh, and studied for a while at this university too. Uh, so this is a picture of, uh, this is a building from Communist University uh, taken in the uh, 1920s. That, uh, this, this is a different building. This is. Uh, newspaper uh, offices. And that building on the right still exists uh, in downtown Moscow. Uh, that building from Communist University no longer exists. But there is one building left, another one, uh, that still does exist. And this is a class of students from Communist University. Um, very interesting school. Uh, it was created uh, in 1921 by the Communist Party. Uh, it was mainly a, uh, it was sort of they were trying to create an international school. Um, in fact, most of the students at Communist University of the Toilers of the East were citizens of the Soviet Union, 
but about 40% of the student body was made up of foreign students from uh, what were called Eastern countries. So a lot of students from China, uh, a lot of students from uh, Iran, uh, a lot of uh, Arab students, a lot of students from India. Um, uh, Ho Chi Minh studied at Communist University of the Toilers of the East. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, the former leader of China, uh, he also studied at Communist University uh, in, the, in the 1920s. And uh, Nazim Hikmet, uh, his friend Vala would return after two years. It was a two-year school, uh, so Vala got his degree and went back to Istanbul. Uh, but Nazim ended up staying uh, until the end of uh, 1928. So he studied there, uh, and then he worked there as a teacher and as a translator. Uh, as well uh, for uh, about six years. Um, while Nazim Hikmet was in Moscow, um, it, you know, really his, it, you know, when you read about the way he, he writes about this period of his life, um, it, it, it really changed his mind about all sorts of things. Um, he, I, I think, really thrived in this international atmosphere at the university uh, where he was studying. Uh, his poetry changed considerably during this period. Nazim and Bala had both been pretty traditional in their poetry uh, up until now. Um, I mean, basically rhyming couplets of the sort that were popular in Istanbul when Nazim and Bala were adolescents, basically. And so uh, Nazim Hikmet meets uh, Vladimir Mayakovsky, who was uh, a very famous Russian futurist poet, uh, very experimental at the time, uh, and this is something that ends up having an enormous influence uh, over Nazim Pigmet's poetry, and he begins uh, publishing a lot of his poetry for the first time uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, and so, you know, this is a time not only for work, but he, uh, he Newshead comes and visits him, they get married for a little while, uh, she ends up leaving and going back to Turkey. Um, Nazim then marries another woman uh, in Moscow, a, uh, a citizen of the Soviet Union, uh, Yulia Yurchenka, uh, whom he met at that time at the university. Uh, but then Nazim himself leaves uh, Moscow in 1928 uh, and returns uh, to, uh, to Istanbul. His life in Istanbul was difficult. Uh, in the 1930s, he started fighting with everyone. Um, first thing he does, he gets back uh, to Istanbul, he begins fighting with the leaders of the underground Turkish Communist Party that did exist in Istanbul. He ends up getting kicked out of the party. From the end of 1929 onward, uh, until much later, uh, he was outside of the party. Then, um, he writes like just the scathing critique of all the leading poets in Istanbul at that time, and becomes really kind of public enemy number one in the literary world of Turkey. Okay, who cares? You know, if you got to pick your enemies, like maybe a big group of poets isn't going to be the most terrifying. <laughs> group. But at that time uh, in Turkey in the twenties and thirties. Um, literary figures often had positions in parliament, a number of them were government ministers. I mean, there, there wasn't that much of an elite population in Turkey in the 20s. And so a lot of the poets and writers that Nazim Hikmet infuriated when he came back to Turkey um, are people who actually were in positions of political power or very close to people who were in positions of political power. And this, more than anything else, is what ended up kind of doing Nazim Hikmet in, at least insofar as his life in Turkey uh, was concerned. Um, he uh, started getting arrested a lot on pretty trumped up charges, and even though he was quite clearly out of the Communist Party at this time. Uh, he was arrested on numerous occasions. The thing is, Nazim Hikmet would then go to court uh, in trial and he would denounce the proceedings. And then, you know, and then this would get into the newspapers and he was really kind of making people look bad 
Uh, of course, you know, they were sort of bringing it upon themselves for arresting him in the first place. But um, you know, he was somebody who really became a public figure of dissent in Turkey in the late 20s and the early 30s. In uh, 1933, uh, he was sentenced to 15 months in prison, uh, so 33, 34. Uh, he was behind bars. Uh, and then in uh, 1938, uh, he was sentenced to 28 years uh, in prison on charges of uh, encouraging mutiny uh, in the Turkish army and navy, um, which basically there was a group of uh, army cadets uh, who had purchased Mazen Hikmet's poetry, books of his poetry, in a bookstore. And uh, the uh, officers running the military school, um, quite an elite military school, uh, found these books and said, well, Nazim Hikmet's a communist, that's bad. Uh, and not only did they expel the military cadets, but they blamed uh, Nazim Hikmet for that, for the fact that these kids had bought his poetry in a bookstore, legally. So, I mean, pretty, pretty kind of grotesque uh, trials. Um, he, uh, he ended up spending only 12 of the, uh, of the 28 years uh, in prison. Um, due to a lot of changes that were taking place in Turkey in the, uh, in the late 1940s. Um, for one thing, uh, after 1946, uh, Turkey became a multi-party democracy. Uh, the Soviet Union uh, began making territorial demands on Turkey in 1948. Uh, and so the Turkish government at that time uh, began having much closer relations with the United States. In 1951, uh, Turkey joined NATO. And um, from that point forward, and even before then, uh, the United States began to play a pretty important role in Turkish politics. Uh, American diplomats began to lobby the Turkish government to release him, because kind of the whole idea of NATO is that it's an alliance of democracies that were fighting the spread of tyranny. And so it didn't look very good for a new NATO member to put somebody in prison for decades for crimes that were just kind of not, like accusations that were really uh, quite nonsensical. Um, and so, and, and Nazim himself began a series of uh, hunger strikes in, 1940, in 1949. Uh, he was released in 1950. However, Within three months of being released from prison, Nazim Hikmet, uh, at age 48, was conscripted into the Turkish army uh, as a private uh, for a three-year period of service. So, I mean, he had health problems in prison, he'd been in prison for years, and he figured that this was basically a death sentence, that, um, you know, either he would just die doing things that soldiers 30 years younger than he was uh, were doing. Or he figured, you know, they would put him on like the border with the Soviet Union and maybe shoot him in the back and claim that he was trying to escape or something like that. But he felt pretty confident that um, he wouldn't survive the, the three year period of conscription. So he, uh, his brother-in-law uh, rented a 14-foot uh, Chris Craft uh, motorboat like that. And uh, the plan uh, was basically to um, go out. I'm sorry, this isn't very good uh, uh, here. We can't really see very much. But the plan was to leave Istanbul, which is basically here, and take a boat uh, to Bulgaria. So this is 1951. Uh, Bulgaria at that time was also a communist country. It was an ally of the Soviet Union. So escaping to Bulgaria seemed like a good idea. And then from there, maybe he could get to uh, the USSR. Um, it so happens that as Nazim and his brother-in-law were going out onto the Black Sea from Istanbul, they came across a Romanian cargo ship. Uh, Romania at that time was also a communist country. It was also in the Warsaw Pact. And so getting to Romania, as far as Nazim was concerned, was just as good as getting to Bulgaria. Uh, and easier, because the ship was right there. 
Uh, so they, they made contact with the, the crew. Uh, the crew shot off their motors. They knew who Nazim Hikmet was because during the previous year and a half, uh, during the period of his hunger strikes when he was trying to get out of jail in Turkey, his cause was being championed in the media of the Eastern Bloc. Uh, basically said, look at those hypocritical Americans, they're supporting this country, Turkey, which also locks people up for no good reason, et cetera, et cetera, um, as, as basically propaganda. Nevertheless, Nazim Hikmet was, was pretty well known. He explained to the uh, ship on this, uh, this Romanian cargo vessel who he was, they let him on board, and they took him to Romania. And from there, he spent a couple of weeks there and then eventually uh, flew uh, to Moscow uh, where he would live uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, Nazim Hikmet uh, would, uh, you know, spend 12 kind of bittersweet years um, in, uh, in Moscow. Um, he, uh, he married uh, that woman, Vera Tulyakova, uh, in 1960, so just a few years before he died. On the one hand, uh, living in the Soviet Union, he was a very well-treated person, and this has a lot to do with his, his propaganda value. Um, here he was, somebody who had fled a NATO country uh, for the Eastern Bloc. Here was someone who had chosen to go to the Soviet Union at a time when there were a lot of stories, I mean, this is in the early years of the Cold War, of people fleeing the East Bloc and trying to get to the West somehow. And here is someone who quite clearly had been unjustly imprisoned uh, in Turkey and who had escaped uh, from Turkey, and now he was living uh, in the Soviet Union. For Nazim, I mean, he was, he was, so in many ways that's better than rotting in a prison in Turkey or, you know, being a 50-year-old military conscript. So that, that was kind of good, that, that side of things. Uh, he was given a very nice apartment, he was given a very nice cottage uh, outside of Moscow. He was able to travel a lot, I mean, basically to other communist countries or, you know, kind of communist, semi-communist countries. Um, and uh, he was able to publish. Um, so, you know, on that side of things, uh, uh, life was, was quite good uh, in Moscow. At the same time, um, the post it was not overt propaganda by any means, but he was no longer pushing any boundaries. Um, I, I haven't talked that much about his poetry, but I mentioned when he was in Moscow for the first time in the 1920s. You know, he really embraced a lot of experimental poetry. When he came back to Turkey, he changed his style, but still he was always innovative and always kind of doing things that was interesting reading one way or another. By the time he, he's older and he's, he's living in Moscow during the last 12 years of his life, his poetry became quite safe. Uh, maybe that would have happened anyway, but I mean, Stalin was still in power when, when he went to the Soviet Union. Stalin only died in 1953. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's not an easy political atmosphere to maneuver. Uh, and he hadn't lived in the Soviet Union for decades. And Moscow was a very different place in the 1920s much more freewheeling place than it was in the 1950s. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it wasn't an, an easy time uh, for him. He was, he was married to a Turkish woman at the time that he fled Istanbul in 1951, um, and she was not allowed to, she basically ended up taking all the blame for his escape, and she was basically put under house arrest um, her own life, I mean, she couldn't get a job anywhere. Um, her own life was, was pretty terrible. Um, and uh, she eventually escaped from Turkey, also by boat, in 1960. Uh, however, by that time, it was too late. He'd already married, fallen in love with, and married Vera Tulyakova. Um, and uh, Nazim's Turkish wife only found out about that um, a few months before she fled Turkey. But she did know before she fled Turkey. But, um, yeah, although she, her name is Munavera Andach, Nazim Hikmet's Turkish wife, and she went on to become, moved to France eventually, and became a very well-known, uh, very important translator of uh, novelists uh, from uh, Turkish to French. 
uh, in, including uh, not only Nazi Hikmet, but also uh, perhaps some of you have heard of uh, Orhan Pamuk, uh, who's a Turkish novelist who won the uh, Nobel Prize for literature about 10 years ago. Um, and she, she went on to have a very kind of long and interesting career uh, in, uh, in living in France. Uh, as I said, Nazim Hikmet's own life um, in emigration after fleeing um, his, his homeland, again, I, I think he's probably glad he did it because life had become intolerable for him in Turkey. Um, nevertheless, I, I think it was probably a, uh, a difficult choice um, for, for him to make. Um, so when, when we think of Nazim Hikmet uh, and his legacy, it, it kind of depends on, on who you ask. Um, so this is, uh, this is a uh, Nazim Hikmet's tomb in the uh, Novodyedeshi uh, Cemetery in Moscow, very sort of elite, exclusive uh, cemetery where a lot of kind of famous uh, Soviet writers uh, and artists uh, are buried there. Uh, and uh, in the Soviet Union and in the Eastern Bloc, uh, Nazim Hikmet was always well remembered until the early 1990s. Um, after the fall of state communism in Eastern Europe in 1989, and then the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991, people stopped talking about Nazim Hikmet. And his books, which had always been in print in the Soviet Union, uh, were you know, basically uh, no longer in print. And he was forgotten quite early on. Um, that's in the Soviet Union. Um, because basically, Nazim Hikmet is somebody who had been valuable to the Soviet Union for propaganda purposes. Once the Soviet Union was no longer there, once you know, the Eastern Bloc no longer existed, once state communism had come to an end uh, in Eastern Europe, that, that was kind of it. Um, uh, people lost their interest in him. Although there are still a few diehard fans of Nazim Hikmet in Russia that I met. Um, in Turkey, just the opposite. So uh, Nazim Hikmet had been a controversial figure. I mean, he's somebody who had been, you know, frequently, uh, you know, mistreated by the state and um, in Turkey. Uh, and some people liked him, some didn't. It, it really had to do with with one's politics. You know, other leftists liked him and, and saw him as a martyr. Uh, people on the political right, you know, thought that he basically brought on his struggles uh, on his own. I, I kind of agree with both of these perspectives to a certain degree. Um, he certainly did bring on the troubles of his own. However, the sort of punishment that he received was kind of far out of bounds with uh, the transgressions that he'd actually committed. Um, in the 1960s and 70s and, and early 1980s, um, after Nazim Hikmet was dead, he became a symbol in Turkey. There was a lot of political division between the left and the right in Turkey. Uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, during the Cold War, Nazim Hikmet's uh, books were just completely banned uh, in, in Turkey uh, for a period of about two decades. Um, it, people would get in trouble for like having a book by Nazim Hikmet, just like you know what, what got him into trouble uh, in the 1930s with the military cadets. You know, he was he was somebody uh, who was really a quite radioactive. Uh, for some people in Turkey, a very, very controversial figure. Um, once the Cold War came to an end, whereas in the Soviet Union he became kind of largely forgotten and in the Eastern Bloc, in Turkey he, he developed into this national figure. Um, and with the end of the Cold War, people stopped fighting uh, about Nazim Hikmet. And he's somebody that people both on the political left and the political right embrace. Uh, as a as one of the most important uh, figures in Turkish history, um, he uh, recent so maybe some of you are familiar with uh, the current political uh, system in Turkey. Uh, a fellow named uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan is the, the president of Turkey, and he's you know he's he's an interesting figure. That's that's for sure. But but quite. Quite on the on the on the right uh, politically in Turkish politics, and uh, his party has has been in control of, of 
most political institutions in Turkey for more than 20 years, since 2002. Um, and uh, about eight years ago, uh, Nazim Hikmet's uh, citizenship, his Turkish citizenship, he'd been stripped of his Turkish citizenship when he fled Turkey in 1951. Um, his citizenship was restored by an act of parliament uh, at a time when parliament was dominated by right-wing political parties. Um, it's, it's something that kind of interesting is like no matter how bitter uh, certain disputes uh, can ultimately be, and nothing was more bitter than the way people responded to Nazi Hikmet in Turkey during the Cold War. But maybe like one kind of lesson uh, that Nazi Hikmet's life and experiences can teach us is that uh, no matter how divided societies are, um, over time, uh, all wounds really do heal. Um, and after decades of this person uh, being the subject of either love and adulation or hate, um, he's somebody that uh, actually sort of connects people uh, today in, in Turkey, regardless uh, of, their, uh, of their politics. So that's something that I consider um, you know, very interesting uh, about his life. Um, you know, we, we talked uh, at the beginning of like what we can make of all of this and why somebody would want to cross borders uh, in the first place. I think in, in Nazim Hikmet's case, I mean, that was a question I raised at the beginning of tonight, but his life, as I mentioned, had, had become uh, quite, uh, quite intolerable. Um, what were the consequences of all of this? I think the consequences were, on the one hand, um, he's somebody who uh, just became the object of derision uh, publicly in Turkey, and he was somebody who received a lot of adulation uh, in the Soviet bloc. Uh, but that, too, was something that couldn't last forever. And once the Cold War came to an end, he ended up being largely forgotten in the Soviet Union and the East Bloc. And his reputation became revived uh, in, uh, in Turkey. What interested me most uh, about writing uh, about Nazim Hikmet, so I, you know, hundreds of books about this guy had been published over the years, so, you know, one could be you know, forgiven for asking, well, why, why do you want to write about this person if so much has been written about him already? Uh, it's kind of a fair question. Does the world really need book 491 about this character? Um, there were a couple of things that uh, interested me in writing about him. First of all, lots had been written about him, but no one had ever worked in the uh, Soviet archives. And um, the, the, a lot of books have been written about him, but in many ways, always kind of the same book, um, based on Nazim Hikmet's own writings, uh, like the memoirs and reflections, recollections of his friends and loved ones, um, but but very and, and very little information about his life in the Soviet Union. Um, but because I work on both the Middle East and, and read Turkish sources, and I also work on Russia and, and read Russian sources, I realized um, that there were thousands of pages of archival material pertaining to Nazim Hikmet in Soviet archives in Moscow. Uh, and so in uh, 2016, 2017, I spent nine months uh, in Moscow uh, researching uh, in the archives. Then I spent the summer of 2019 uh, in, in Moscow as well. And uh, it was fascinating and really ended up changing my, my views about him to uh, a large degree. Um, so that's one reason why I wrote about him. Um, and the second reason I wrote about him is I felt I could see something in, in his life that hadn't been addressed in other books that had been written about him. Um, mainly what, what kind of interested me uh, about Nazi uh, was his border crossing. Um, all these travels that he took and the ways in which every time he crossed a border, this would have some sort of impact on his life, either good or bad and usually precisely because he had crossed borders early on in life. So, you know, he goes to Moscow when he's you know, 22 years old, and he and his friend Vala are celebrated for being, you know, these foreigners who are interested in communism. And they were embraced in Moscow 
not simply tolerated, embraced, because, and people are must have saying, isn't this great? People from all over the world are coming here to learn about communism, and then they'll go back to their homes and spread communism. This is wonderful. Um, then he goes back to Turkey, and for the very same reasons that he was celebrated in Russia, he was denigrated in Turkey, because he'd been in the Soviet Union, and he'd been a communist, and you know, these th sorts of things. And then similarly, later on in life, he's being you know, imprisoned and threatened with conscription, uh, and Turkey crosses the border, and he's again sort of embraced as a, as a propaganda figure for the use of the Soviets, and that's kind of the role that he had to play for, um, for the rest of his life. And I'll, I'll just say this, um, before we turn it over to Q&A, um, one thing I really noticed when I started working in the archives in Moscow was how common his story was. Um, and that's why the subtitle of the book is Nazim Hikmet and His Generation, uh, because it's not just a book about Nazim Hikmet and what he was doing in the Soviet Union in Turkey. It's, it's a book about uh, a generation of people who were born at the turn of the 20th century, came of age in the early uh, 1920s, people who, like Nazim and his friend Bala, uh, had grown up in an empire. Um, empires with, with very porous frontiers, with a lot of different religions and ethnicities living in, inside them, huge states. Um, and I started wondering, well, what happens to this generation of people? And in particular, I'm thinking about Nazim's classmates at uh, Communist University, the Toilers of the East. All these people, you know, they in the 1920s, they're, they're traveling, they're going back and forth, you know, not just from Turkey to the Soviet Union, but from a bunch of countries to the Soviet Union. They're being celebrated. What happens to them in the 1930s when the doors start closing behind them? That was definitely the case in the Soviet Union. Uh, the purges that took place in the 1930s were especially geared toward foreigners living in the Soviet Union. So Nazim Hikmet was very lucky uh, to have returned to Turkey in 1928, because if he'd stayed in the Soviet Union, he probably would not have survived the 1930s. But in Turkey in the 1930s, OK, you're, you're not having millions and millions of people sent to their deaths in labor camps, which was the case in the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, in Turkey, I mean, Nazim Hikmet's own experiences, the experiences of other uh, communists who came back to Turkey, people spending years of their life uh, in prison, uh, and all of the effects that that, that has uh, on people. So it's, it's this border crossing generation that really kind of ended up interesting me. Uh, when I was writing this book, and looking at the ways, kind of, I'm an historian, um, that Nazim's life fits in to a broader context, and looking at similarities between Nazim Hikmet's life and the life of just a bunch of ordinary people who happened to be at communist universities, but people who did not go on to become famous poets like Nazim, people whose names, you know, I'd certainly never heard of uh, before, and looking at all these people that are at this university alongside Nazim Hikmet, and then I trace a number of them, not just Nazim Hikmet, but a number of other people uh, up until the 1980s, and look at what happens to their lives uh, in the decades uh, that follow. So um, for me, that, that ended up being kind of uh, the, the most interesting part uh, of the book, was looking at you know, how a life of the sort that I've sort of just described right now, which seems at, at first glance just so bizarre and strange and different. He's traveling around, he's doing all of these different things, and yet in many ways uh, he had a lot in common with, uh, with his generation. So I think I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, hopefully we can do a Q&A. Uh, but for now, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. 
right before he died, yeah. looked like he had sort of a facial expression of something else that had to do. Yeah. Not, so did he have anything? No. Right, right. Well, I think he was somebody who did a very good job of making the best of his surroundings. Um, so even when he was in prison uh, in Turkey, like some of the best and most celebrated poetry that he wrote, it's not the American, the experimental stuff that he wrote in Moscow in the 20s. It's the stuff that he wrote when he was in solitary confinement in prison. He had no one to show his works to. And that's some of the, I'm not a huge fan of his poetry, to be quite honest. With you. I like some of it, others I don't really like. He's, he's someone that I always uh, kind of inserts himself into his poetry in a lot that I, I don't really like all that much personally. That's my personal taste. But uh, the poetry that he wrote in the like mid 1940s, when he was he'd already been in prison for seven or eight years, and as far as he knew, he was going to be in prison for another 20 years. Uh, he'd sort of given up on ever getting out. Uh, that's the most beautiful poetry that he wrote. His masterpiece is a book called. Uh, Human Landscapes from My Country. And it's, it's sort of an epic story of what is today called the Turkish War of Independence. Mustafa Kemal to Turk's rebellion that ended up being successful and culminated in the, uh, in the creation of Turkey. So um, Nazim Hikmet wrote that book, Human Landscapes from My Country, uh, when he was in prison in the 1940s. And he's interviewed, like, a lot of his fellow prisoners had been veterans of that war, and they're telling him stories. And so, you know, he's using, you know, he's in prison, that's not great, but he's talking to the people around them, around him, trying to learn something from it, and trying to be productive in, in one way or another. I think when he was being productive, I think, as you said, that's probably his, his happy place. Um, and he was adaptable. You know, um, and because he had to be, but also I think a lot of that had to do with his experiences as a as a young man. Um, throughout the book, um, I mean, there are lots of stories about and Nazim Hikmet's story and the story of a lot of other people, uh, his contemporaries, who are doing really interesting things for the rest of their lives, due in some part to travels they had taken to a foreign country when they were still relatively young. And uh, you see a lot of that in the book. And then something else you see a lot of in the book is what happens when those borders are closed and people like Nazim Hikmet are stuck being only in Turkey or only in the Soviet Union. And there isn't really a very good choice uh, between those two if you're living in the 1950s. Um, so, you know, when it comes to borders and stuff, that's a controversial issue, and that's an issue for policymakers, as far as I'm concerned. But the, the book uh, kind of, I, I kept seeing all these interesting stories that build upon the fact that people were crossing borders and doing things. Uh, and then you see how much of that is lost uh, when those borders end up being shut. Sorry, and that, that's a lot of that had nothing to do with your question, maybe, but thank you. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Yes, sir. And, uh, oh, T I. Yeah. Does, it, does that? Sorry, I thought it was a J I. Is that what it no, says on the back? No, no, it's Harsco Rush. Okay, okay, sir. Yes. So the second time he was in prison in Turkey, who was it, or how? Who was he threatening, and how? Why were they mad at him, and why did they need to throw him away and put him out of public circulation? Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, part of it had been that. Even though he'd been in prison for a year already in 1933, 34, um, he still had a lot of enemies in the Turkish state. But 1938, uh, when he was sentenced to 28 years in prison, is a particularly important date in Turkish history because that's the year that Ataturk died. So Mustafa Kemal, who was instrumental in creating the Republic of Turkey, became president uh, when the Republic was created in 1923 died and, and was, was very ill for about a year before he died. It was clear he was dying. And so there was a lot of division in the military between people on the left, people on the right. Uh, again, this is 1938. Uh, people are pretty you know, certain 
that a war is going to take place in Europe. Uh, within the military, there were a lot of communists who thought that Turkey should be allied with the Soviet Union. Uh, within the military, there were also a lot of people who thought Turkey should be allied with Germany. Um, and so I think, to a certain extent, the timing in 1938 had to do with the fact that Ataturk's weakening and dying, and there's a lot of score settling taking place between people on the political left and the political right in Turkey, trying to you know, jostle for position so that they can be in power once Ataturk passed away. Um, I think you, did you have a second question after that, or was that, uh, does that answer what you were asking me, Seth? Um, sort of. Did he ever sort of possess political power of his own right? In no, no. He was um, just a symbol, right? Yeah, he was a symbol. I mean, he uh, was, was seen as a possible future leader of the Turkish Communist Party when he was in Moscow in the 1920s. Um, but again, he ended up breaking with the party uh, soon after returning uh, to Turkey. And from that point forward, he was seen as a symbol and somebody of, in the Soviet Union who had enormous propaganda value, and in Turkey as somebody who was dangerous and seditious and needed to be silenced and, and put away. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes? I assume he was aware he was going to be used as a propaganda tool. I think he, yeah. And I think so. I mean, it's it's hard to say. Um, he he was certainly very depressed uh, in uh, basically the two years uh, before he died. Um, his death is is usually described as uh, a heart attack, which is very plausible. He'd had two heart attacks earlier in life. He was not in good health, um, so it's it's very possible that he died of a heart attack. Yet. At the same time, you know, when, and this is one thing that looking at his personal papers uh, in an archive can kind of teach you that like a memoir uh, or somebody else's memoir won't teach you is that, um, you know, he was, he was doing a lot of things, like he talked about death, like if you go to, you know, like any kind of website and they show like signs that somebody's contemplating suicide, like he checked every box, like he constantly talked about death um, he was like tidying up all of his affairs. Um, I mean, just going to enormous lengths to make sure that in the event of his death, uh, his wife, uh, Vera, uh, the Russian wife that he had at the end of his life, and a son that he fathered with his Turkish wife, uh, that they would be taken care of. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's speculation. I have no idea. Maybe he died. Of a he was obviously very depressed. Uh, during uh, the last uh, few years of his life, even like starting within about a year after marrying uh, Vera. That marriage had a lot of problems in it as well. Uh, there were a lot of reports of infidelities on both sides. Um, you know, it, I, I, I think his life was kind of hard and kind of sad, but in most cases, I think he felt he had to persevere. I, I'm not exactly sure what happened end of his life, but um, yeah, so publicly he seemed very happy, privately, I, I think life was kind of hard for him. Yeah. Yes, sir. Did um, he and his uh, best friend maintain contact or, and or reconnect in later years? Yeah, so Vala Nureddin, who, the former communist, uh, he goes back to Turkey, gets a job with the Chamber of Commerce uh, in Istanbul, <laughs> and uh, then he became a journalist. Uh, he got into a fight with Nazim uh, over politics, reportedly, who knows, uh, and they didn't speak to each other for several years, but then after Nazim was in prison, after he got that huge prison sentence in 1938, uh, their friendship was rekindled, and they were friends, uh, you know, pretty much until the end of their lives. However, they had no contact with one another after 1951. So, you know, I mean, they, Nazim didn't really have contact with anybody, uh, except his Turkish wife, who was allowed to correspond with him a few years after he fled. But as for anybody else, like, they were basically cut off uh, at that point. But, uh, they continued to write about one another in very positive, favorable terms. It seems like there was general, uh, you know, uh, they, they liked each other. 
but they, yeah, they weren't able to talk to each other, spend any time to each other, with each other. Yes, sir. Wonder, um, when and where did you learn your Russian, and have you been back to uh, Russia since the invasion of Ukraine? Yeah, no, I, I haven't been back uh, to Russia since the invasion, uh, and I kind of doubt I'll be able to go back uh, for a while. Um, I started learning Russian, uh, I lived in uh, Istanbul for seven years after college. So this is another reason why I'm kind of interested in this, you know, the lives of people who cross borders uh, and how that can sort of affect people's lives. So um, I, had, I graduated from college in 1991 and I, I didn't want to go and see a country that had recently become communist, I wanted to go and see countries in Eastern Europe that had just had these revolutions overthrowing communist regimes. And uh, I really wanted to uh, find a job teaching English as a second language in like Prague or Budapest or Warsaw somewhere. Kind of like Nazim and Bala, like my trip ended up going in unexpected directions and about seven different things happened to me and if any of them had happened differently, I probably wouldn't have ended up in Istanbul. But instead, I found a job teaching English as a second language in Istanbul and lived there for seven years. And um, I was also just very interested in Russia at the time because of political things that had been happening. The Soviet Union had just broken up. Uh, I began visiting Russia. Uh, and I found a uh, Russian language teacher in Istanbul, uh, a lady named Tatiana, who was from uh, Kharkiv uh, in Ukraine. And uh, she, her husband, was uh, from Azerbaijan, so also a Soviet citizen, but uh, people in Azerbaijan speak a language that's kind of similar to Turkish, so they, they were able to get jobs in Turkey. Uh, she was a professor of engineering in the Soviet Union, and like, she's teaching me Russian as a second language in Istanbul. Um, and uh, so I started uh, with Tatiana studying Russian, and then I had sort of a series of uh, former Soviet Russian language teachers uh, when I was living in Turkey. Uh, and then when I was 30, I moved back to the United States and I did an MA and a PhD. And that's when I, I found other teachers <laughs> to help with my Russian and kind of build upon what I, I've been learning. Uh, but yeah, and uh, I spent a lot of time um, in, uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, like in different parts of the Soviet Union, uh, or the former Soviet Union, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. Um, and uh, it was very nice being able to travel between Turkey and Russia and going back and forth and working on different projects uh, between those two countries. And in uh, 2022, I was supposed to go and spend the summer uh, in, uh, in Russia, uh, but history got in the way, so we'll just have to see what happens with that. Any other questions? I yes. assume as Nazim was a, a wealthy man, but did he make money from his poetry and his books? Yeah, good question. Yeah, in, uh, in the Soviet Union, he lived very well, um, and part of that had to do with you know, the, the state gave him a nice apartment, gave him a nice cottage, gave him a car, you know, things that ordinary Soviet citizens wouldn't have that kind of access uh, to. Um, and uh, he earned, I mean, for a classless society, he was pretty wealthy uh, by Soviet standards. I mean, he uh, published a lot of poetry. The real moneymaker, though, uh, according to Nazim in, the, in some of the archival material that he studied was uh, the real moneymaker was uh, theater. Who knew? I didn't know. But yeah, and he, so he wrote a lot of plays, and his friends would kind of ask him, well, your poetry is really good, but you're not really a playwright. Why are you writing all these plays? And he said, like, I need the money. Um, because he was supporting uh, his ex-wife, the Turkish wife, who escaped from Turkey in her own right, and uh, ended up living in Poland for several years before going to France. But she was now living in the communist world, so he had to pay her money and child support. He had this new wife, uh, Vera, you know, and he was taking her to like Paris and Rome and stuff, and quite expensive, I mean, for anybody, but especially on uh, like Soviet rubles. Like, so he had a lot of expenses kind of toward the end of his life, and he was always worried about money. <laughs> 
Uh, in Turkey, um, from 1936 onward, uh, the sale of his poetry was illegal. Um, and so he was making money like writing jokes anonymously in newspapers. Uh, he was doing like the dubbing uh, for foreign films. And like he had all these kind of weird jobs that friends of his and like sympathizers had given him. Um, as a way to earn some money. Um, but yeah, he was, yeah, just kind of, yeah, I mean, yeah, just doing kind of weird things, trying to kind of hold means together. So his, his financial situation, he, one, one per, like a, a sort of common phrase about Nazim was he was a proletariat in a communist country. And, you know, he was a capitalist in a, no, he was a proletarian, sorry, in a capitalist country, and he became a capitalist in a communist country. Uh, so, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You want to give us a prediction on the uh, Russian-Ukraine war? <laughs> Who knows? I have no idea. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, last year, when, when I came here and talked about the Russian-Ukraine war, uh, I was saying I could see this kind of leading to the end of the Putin regime. I still feel that way. I, I don't think that that's going to go on forever, but it could go on for years uh, the way it is right now. Yeah. Any other questions? Come on, I'm sure you've got some. <laughs> yes? What kind of a relationship did he have with his son, if any? Troubled. Troubled. Yeah, so... You know, I mean, his son was three months old when Nazi left uh, Turkey and uh, didn't see him again uh, until his son was 10. And uh, by that point, Nazi was married to, to somebody else. And so uh, when uh, Nazim's Turkish wife, uh, Munavera Amdaç, the one who became a translator later on, when she fled Turkey uh, in 1960, uh, she made her way to Warsaw. I mentioned early on in the talk that Nazim had this great grandfather that was a Polish count who converted to Islam and become a famous Ottoman general. Well, Nazim had been able to get uh, Polish citizenship uh, for himself. He had trouble getting Soviet citizenship, which shows that despite the fact that there was a lot of propaganda value for him in the Soviet Union, the Soviet government didn't trust him. Uh, and uh, he was able to get um, Polish citizenship, and Poland was an East Bloc country. And so when his wife fled Turkey, she uh, took a boat and got to Greece. Uh, in Greece, she told the police that she lost her passport and she was a Polish citizen, she, uh, Polish citizen through her husband. And uh, the Polish embassy in Athens said, yes, she's a citizen. They, they knew the situation. And they flew her up to Warsaw, and she got a job. Her first job was teaching Turkish in Warsaw. Uh, but yeah, she has this young son. Um, and uh, yeah, he grew up quite bitter toward his father. He, uh, his name was uh, Mehmet Nazim. And uh, Mehmet Nazim ended up uh, you know, giving a very sort of negative interview uh, about his father in like 1971. Uh, basically saying that his, his dad had, you know, sold his poems for rubles and was quite critical of him and uh, refused to talk about his father publicly after that for the rest of his life. And he died, Mehmet Nazim died, uh, about five years ago. Uh, he was living in Paris. Um, but yeah, they, they had kind of a difficult relationship, it seems. Can yes. we buy your book on Amazon or just, I mean... I would, in fact, I would recommend Amazon. When this book first came out, it cost $131. <laughs> I was devastated when I saw that. Uh, but the price has since come down to $30. And I'm not sure if that's a good sign or a bad sign. Uh, maybe so many people are buying it that they, they decided to lower the price. Maybe nobody's buying it. And that's why, by a few desperation, they've decided to lower the price. But if you look, unfortunately, at other online sellers, it's often selling in like the high double digits or low triple figures. So I would say, you know, you can get it for thirty dollars uh, on, on Amazon, and that's by far kind of the, the most realistic uh, price uh, that's out there. But yes, uh, it's 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 available, and a uh, 
paperback version is supposed to come out uh, next year. So uh, we'll see uh, what happens with that. Thank you for asking. Yeah. I appreciate that question. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Yes? Do you have a new project you're working on? I kind of do. I mean, I think it's kind of important not to just dive into a project, uh, like you dive into a marriage or something like that. It's like important to kind of wait and see. Maybe that's why I'm still single at age 54. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, this project, for example, just came kind of out of nowhere. Uh, after I, I finished my first book in 2014, and that was kind of more important for like a university professor because that's connected to tenure and whether or not you keep working at the university or you get fired. So uh, I was celebrating tenure. It comes with a modest raise, and you know my, my first book had been published. And I just I went to I know this is a very long answer here. Excuse me. I uh, I went to, and I decided. Summer of 2015, I didn't want to do any research for the first time since I'd started an MA program in 1999. I was going to pay for my own plane ticket and just travel as a tourist for a month in Russia and for a month in Turkey and just go to places without archives that I'd always wanted to see, but I'd never really spent time in because there was no real research purpose to it. So I just traveled. And when I was in Turkey, I was at a bookstore. And uh, I, I, was, I was in Bodrum, which is like a, a beach resort. But anyway, uh, I, and uh, I, I went into a bookstore, and I, I just wanted to read something light in Turkish. Uh, I thought that would be kind of cool. Uh, and I found this book about Nazim Hikmet's visits to Azerbaijan. And it wasn't a very interesting book, but it kind of got me thinking. I was like, I wonder if anybody's ever like looked at Soviet archives for something like this. And then I started investigating, and I saw that nobody had. And I think I was able to find a project that I really connected to, precisely because I wasn't really looking for it. And it just kind of found me. And uh, last, uh, so winter break, not this past one, but in December of 2022, early 2023, uh, I spent about a month in Istanbul. And wherever I went, people, Turkish people, were speaking to me in Russian. Uh, and because they thought I was either a Russian or a Ukrainian, uh, just because of the way I look, uh, compared to most people in Turkey. And uh, I, everywhere I went, I heard people speaking Russian and Ukrainian. Uh, and I mean, Turkey's filled, Istanbul especially, is filled with uh, basically mothers and children uh, who have fled uh, Ukraine and fighting age males who have fled Russia. Uh, and they're in Turkey uh, largely because it's easy to go there. Like, it's, you don't really need a visa. If you do need a visa, you just pay for it. It's 20 bucks, you're in. You know, it's a lot easier to get into Turkey than to go to like Italy or France or England or something like that, especially if you're Russian or Ukrainian. And uh, everybody kept speaking to me in Russian Ukrainian. I kept hearing it all the time. And um, this kind of got me interested in uh, Russian refugees who fled Russia after 1917 uh, and who ended up in Turkey for the same reasons that there are Russians and Ukrainians in Turkey today, because it was the easiest place to get to. Um, and so I, I'm kind of interested in that. Um, and uh, in particular, like, and this is a very sort of unexpected twist, but I found the stories of these three American women who are in their early 40s who get up and move to Istanbul separately uh, to work as aid workers to help Russian refugees uh, who were living in Istanbul in the early 20s. And all three of these women ended up spending like 10 years in Turkey in the 20s. And they've kind of taken over the project. Uh, I was originally going to write about the refugees, uh, but I found all of this stuff about these three women and pretty fascinating lives, and I found a lot of material in different places. And uh, we'll see. I mean, I think I'll still end up talking about the refugees a little bit, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, they say that history is written by the victors. History is written by people who uh, 
leave behind a lot of materials, a lot of documents, <laughs> very readable handwriting. Uh, and when I, when I come across that, that ends up kind of taking over the project. Anything else? Well, thank you both, and thank you all very much.